Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to another edition of the Mogcast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, in conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, when the Prime Minister won the vote of confidence, the leadership ballot last week, there were different reactions from people who um, voted against her. Some said, well, she's won and that's an end of it. Um, you persisted in st saying that she should go. Is that still your view? Uh, no, it's not. Um, it was one last push to say that the result had not been by any means as good as the Prime Minister might have hoped for. But she has won under the rules of the Conservative Party. She is the leader, and I will support her as leader of the Conservative Party and as Prime Minister, that I'm not interested in being an irreconcilable or a dog in the manger or whatever image you like to conjure up, that the Prime Minister has won under the rules and um, that she has decided to stay on, and therefore Conservatives ought to support her. A critic might say you were very much a dog in the manger immediately in the aftermath of her winning. You were very dog in the mangery about it. Why have you changed your mind? Um, I was indeed a dog in the manger after it. Why have I changed my mind? Uh, because that was the last effort that we'd had the vote, the result had come through. You know as well as I do that the interpretation of the result can be as important as the result. Uh, and there was a chance that the result would be interpreted differently. It hasn't been, and therefore it is in the interest of the country and the Conservative Party that people like me should now recognise that the leadership question is settled, and I will support the Prime Minister, and I will support her personally, though not necessarily every element of policy, uh, with enthusiasm. That This has been decided, and it would be silly of me to try and keep on attacking the leader of the Conservative Party. She now has my support, and that is not um, equivocal support, she has my full support, uh, and therefore it's not really helpful, having said that, to go back into the reasons why I wasn't saying that last week. But there were reasons. All right, let's week. just roll this series of thoughts forward, because this is uh, going to be quite big news to uh, the people who are listening to this modcast. Um, let us suppose, for the sake of the argument, that um, sooner or later, the faction in cabinet who want an indicative vote on ways forward get their way. Let's roll our thoughts forward from there and assume that sooner or later the Prime Minister's position simply collapses. I mean, after all, her position on a number of elements of Brexit policy have collapsed, so it's not impossible to imagine this one might. So let's suppose she puts forward legislation to. Um, uh, either postpone the date of Article 50, or I, I think more likely pull Article 50 altogether and stay in the European Union. Let's then suppose Labour table a vote of confidence in the government. Would you vote with the government in those circumstances? I've always intended uh, to vote with the government in a vote of confidence that um, Conservative MPs ought to support the Conservative Party in a vote of confidence under the Fixed Term Parliament Act that that is about keeping the Conservative Party in office and not handing Downing Street over to Jeremy Corbyn, which I or moving to an early general election, um, that I may disagree with individual items of policy, but I certainly have confidence that the Conservatives are better at governing than the Labour Party is. So even if the only instrument of stopping a second referendum is a vote of confidence, you're going to back Theresa May and the government. But it isn't, because you've got to get legislation through. Now, you mentioned Article 50. I, I would differentiate two types of change to Article 50. I think if the government were to seek an extension, it can do that just by asking for it. It doesn't need legislation to extend. <coughs> the, I just stop you and say it has been put to me that it would need a vote, not legislation, but a vote for extension. Do you have a view on that? I don't see why it would need a vote. Parliament legislated to allow the government to use Article 50, and Article 50 allows for an extension with the unanimous consent of the other member states. I think that's already been voted on as it happens. 
the government might have a vote, but I'm not sure strictly it would need one. Um, if it were to suspend Article 50 permanently, cancel it, in accordance with the European Court of Justice's recent ruling, then I think it would need legislation. And this was the view given by Robert Buckland, the Solicitor General, uh, on the Westminster Hour last night, that the Gina Miller case would indicate that the prerogative has now been bound, and when it's bound in one direction, historically it's been bound in the other direction. You, you don't get any sense that, um, and I'm just picking up this weekend's reports, that Gavin Barwell, David Liddington and others have been looking around for ways of, um, um, in effect, cancelling Brexit, cancelling Article 50 without a Commons vote, without a, a bill, without legislation. Well, I think you phrased this very interestingly in a piece you wrote recently in relation to Robin Cook and hunting, and that I'm sure there are conversations that take place thinking about things that may potentially happen that are not and aren't likely to be official government policy. I think it's highly, highly unlikely that any British government would bring forward a second referendum, uh, partly because it would be so enormously divisive. Uh, and your piece by Nicky Morgan today explained why and how people on both sides would not want to vote again. But from a Conservative and Unionist point of view, if there is a second referendum on being in or out of the European Union, there's absolutely no reason to object to a second referendum on Scotland being in the United Kingdom. And I would have thought as a Unionist that would be um, a policy that one would want to steer clear of. Do you think that um, if the reports over the weekend, which um, David Liddington hasn't really denied them are true, do you think he should resign? I'm not going to get in the business of calling for individual ministers to resign. I tried to get the Prime Minister to go, that didn't work. So I think it's about time I stop talking about who should or shouldn't be in the Cabinet and leave it to the Prime Minister. Let's go on to have a, um, just a bit of a constitutional discussion of the kind we were having before the microphones was, was switched on. Is it important to think ahead? I mean, let's suppose for a moment that there were to be a vote of confidence. You vote with the government, but the government then nonetheless loses. What do you understand the position then to be? Um, if the government loses, the Prime Minister would go to see the Queen and would offer her resignation, at which point the Prime Minister's advice ceases to be authoritative, that the Queen must follow, must follow a Prime Minister's advice except once the Prime Minister has offered her resignation. So the Prime Minister would then suggest another name to take over, but that would not be binding advice on the Queen. Uh, the Queen would probably ask the Prime Minister to stay on as an interim Prime Minister until a new person could be appointed. And then the question is, who would the Queen ask next? Would she ask, which I think the country at large would expect, Jeremy Corbyn, even though he's a long way from commanding a majority in Parliament, <coughs> or would the Queen ask another cabinet minister in the hope that somebody other than Theresa May would be able to command a majority. So you explain to me why you think the Queen might feel she should send for Jeremy Corbyn rather than a, you know, remain leaning um, uh, Conservative member of the Cabinet like um, David Lidington or a leave leaning one like, for example, now Sajid Javid. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. First of all, if Theresa May can't command a majority, what reason would there be to suppose that another Conservative would easily be able to do so. So there would be reason for doubt over whether another Conservative could. But more importantly, I think the general public would feel that the Tories had lost office and therefore the obvious thing to do was to ask the opposition. The constitutional purists will puff on their pipes and say this is not quite how it should be and I'm quite a constitutional purist myself so it's an argument that I fully understand that the Queen, in some nominal sense, ought to call for another Conservative on the basis that another Conservative would have the best chance of forming a government. But the British have a great sense of fair play, and they think if one side has gone down, then it's the other side's turn to see if they can do something. And I think that pressure could be overwhelming, and you would see the debates on television and the discussions in the newspapers, and there would be learned articles written on the Constitution saying this is what should happen, and they would be right in every 
historic precedent. <coughs> but that, the headline on the newspapers would say, where's Jeremy? And I, I, I think the, the Constitution is a living organism. It evolves. We don't have a codified constitution. We don't have a court that can uh, oversee the Queen's judgment on these matters. It would be up to the Queen to decide, and I think she would evolve the constitution in the way almost implied by the Fixed Town Parliament Act that you ask the leader of the next biggest party. I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but I want the listeners to think about it because so far, um, so much of the discussion about Brexit has been bound up with the deal, the situation in Parliament, the divisions in the Cabinet and all these options. But I'm not sure many people have realised that in the event of the Prime Minister losing a no-confidence vote, the Palace is placed in a very difficult position and the Queen, at the end of not having put her foot wrong for the length of her reign, is going to suddenly be plunged into making a, or would suddenly be plunged, into making an extremely difficult and controversial choice. The, the, the Queen has managed to get this very tricky issue right throughout her reign. It's very interesting that lots of people in 1963 thought that the Queen should not have given up her prerogative by accepting Alec Douglas Hume, but should have chosen for herself. Actually, the Queen was very wise to allow her residual political prerogatives to wither on the vine because it has kept the monarchy safe from political controversy throughout her reign. And if you look at both her father and her grandfather, they were much more involved in the selection of prime ministers. You look at George V over uh, the 1909 budget consequences and the two general elections required to get it through. Uh, you look at the rejection of Curzon, you look at George VI and the selection of Churchill, um, the royal prerogative was active. <coughs> the Queen has avoided that, and I think the palace would be very reluctant to use the royal prerogative against what appeared to be the will of the country. Just one follow-up question to this. Let's just suppose that what we're discussing happens and there's a new Prime Minister, it's Prime Minister Lidington or Prime Minister Mordaunt or whoever. Who's the leader of the Conservative Party? Um, well, Theresa May will remain leader of the Conservative Party uh, until she decides not to be. She has at least a year, but I would be very surprised if after a year anyone wanted to challenge her again. So I think the Prime Minister can remain leader of the Conservative Party broadly for as long as she wishes. I was raising the question of what happens if you have a new Prime Minister after a confidence vote, but the leader of the party is still Theresa May. She can't be challenged for a year. I'm not quite sure what the position is. Do you have a Prime Minister who's not the leader of the party? Well, it wouldn't be the first time it's happened. Churchill was Prime Minister and not leader of the party. Chamberlain remained leader of the party um, for the rest of his life, if I remember correctly. Well, I think our listeners and everyone else should reflect on all these possibilities going forward. But can I just take you back um, to the beginning of this discussion? And you know, you've said now that the leadership election and challenge is over and you're going to sort of go four square behind Theresa May. There's an argument that will be put to you that will say, look, haven't the ERG made a bit of a mess of it? First of all, you, you couldn't get the 40 letters um, despite your challenging the Prime Minister in the Commons and the great scrum outside St Stephen's entrance afterwards. So there you are. And then, although her authority has been dented, you failed to pull her down. Yes, that's true. We did fail. I mean, it'd be silly to beat about the bush and pretend uh, that we succeeded when we didn't, that, that we wanted to do something. We haven't done it. We must recognise that. And that's why I will now support the Prime Minister. What do you think her plan is now? We must ask the Prime Minister what her plan is. Uh, I don't know for certain, though the best guess is that the Prime Minister thinks that as time passes, people will come round to her deal thinking that it's better than the two options that people are being threatened with. One is staying within the European Union, the other is leaving without a withdrawal agreement. Um, I don't think this works, partly because people like me 
think that leaving without a withdrawal agreement uh, is nothing to be frightened of and indeed presents considerable opportunities. Trevor Kavanagh has a brilliant piece in The Sun this morning explaining why we'll be fine leaving without a withdrawal agreement and um, if you haven't already highlighted it to your readers, you, you should. The other reason is that the is completely the obverse, that the Labour Party thinks that um, leaving without a deal will be a disaster for the Conservatives, they'll never win an election again, and therefore refusing to vote for anything Theresa May pulls, puts forward helps them. Now that means that the Labour Party will mainly vote against any deal. The SNP will vote against any deal. The DUP will vote against any deal that cuts up Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom. And there are quite a number of us who will vote against a bad deal too. I'm not predicting 117, but we don't need 117. Finally, um, you've been steadfast th throughout these modcasts for a long time that um, given that no deal is the default, um, if there isn't a deal, no deal will happen. Do you see any reason now to revise that view as this campaign for a second referendum for the so-called people's vote begins to accelerate with Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair, Mandelson, all these familiar faces pitching in and some voices on the Conservative side joining in? Um, Chaka Muna has said himself that he doesn't think there's a majority in the House of Commons for a second referendum. The more Tony Blair campaigns for a second referendum, as far as I'm concerned, the better. I think it's enormously helpful in persuading people that it's not a good idea. That he, he, I don't want to be rude about Tony Blair, that he um, managed to do something incredible and have a connection with the electorate that was exceptional and allowed him to do almost anything he wanted in the early period of his premiership but that now he lacks that resonance and support across the country and has become a negative. So I don't think his support for it actually helps. Um, and as they campaign for it, so more people are coming out against it. Uh, we discussed earlier the question of would it legitimise a second referendum in Scotland. The Prime Minister is coming out more determinedly uh, against it. And I think there's also a feeling that it would be deeply irresponsible that We've had a vote. The decision was made. We were told it would be a final decision. Uh, the vote was then validated by a general election where both main parties said they would accept the result. I think you at least need another general election with a party campaigning for a second referendum, a loser's vote, uh, before you have it. So no, I, I, I don't think it's gaining sufficient momentum. And in a funny way, the more people think about it, the more they realise that it's not an easy solution, it's a really bad solution. Well, Jacob, thank you very much. Uh, I wish you a very happy Christmas because we will not be picking up these discussions again until the new year. Who knows what we'll find then? I look forward to it very much. Well, thank you very much. And may I also wish you, all the listeners a very Merry Christmas and in the best Bank of England phrase, a prosperous new year. The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.